Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much for watching the channel, all the comments, subscribers. I greatly appreciate it. This channel is dedicated to the rational investor, the cash flow, cash hungry investor. And we're going to rip through uh, Caterpillar, their financials, and figure out how much free cash flow they actually generate. We're going to look at 10 years of data, then we're going to price the stock and look at it 10 years out forward and see what can we earn by buying the stock today. Let's get to work. Okay, behind me is their 10K that we're going to go through. Before we do that, I want to revisit the five key attributes that we use to value all securities here in this channel. Number one, top line revenue growth. You got to have it. Don't talk to me about a stock that can't grow top line. You got to have top line revenue growth. Number two is earnings. I want the entire enterprise level earnings to be growing, not EPS that can be manipulated by the number of shares I'm saying. I want a business that can grow its top line and bottom line, we use EBITDA for that metric, but EBITDA needs to be growing. Next, I need strong free cash flow. I need a low debt. That means less than three times lever debt to EBITDA is a ratio. And I need a stock that's well priced. Well priced, we use enterprise value to EBITDA. We also use free cash flow, but basically you need a stock whose return is going to be higher than the market. We want something that's going to outperform over the next decade because it's underpriced. That's how we determine something that's well priced. Okay, let's get through and, and, and rip through the 10K. Highly, highly recommend you always read the 10Ks in any investment you're gonna do. They are filled with a, ma a tremendous amount of information, which is extremely valuable, and I love, love reading them. Okay, let's dive through specifically. I wanna go to the uh, 88th page of this uh, presentation to look at their cash flow. Okay, now the rubber meets the road with the cash flow statement. It's my favorite statement. It's your favorite statement. It's always the third statement, balance sheet, income statement, cash flow. This is always the order they appear in the annual statement. This is the cash flow statement, follows the three, the two other ones. The section you want to look for is the operating cash flow. It's the third section, it's the upper third section. And it says net cash provided by operations right there. And they made $6.3 billion in 2020. If you look behind 19 and 18, they made 6.9 and $6.5 billion. So immediately, you should know A, that number is positive all the time. B, it's pretty flat, 6.6, 6.9, 6.3, pretty flat. And then C, it's a large number. $6.4 billion is a lot of jack to make from selling your equipment, right? So cash flow from operations is the line that, 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 that ties to the amount of cash generated when they operate the business, when they sell the equipment, when they pay the employees, when they pay for rent and insurance, what's left over at the end of the day. $6.3 billion. Now, what do they do with that cash? That's down below. So the next third is the investing section. So you scroll down and you get the investing sections right here. And what you want to look for is the CapEx, the capital expenditure. It says right here, capital expenditure actually says it. And then down below, expenditures for equipment leased to others. This is also a CapEx. So this is material that they're buying either to build new factories or build new equipment that they're using to generate the income that they make every year. And you have to put that money back in the business. They can't deprive the business of that cash because that means that the business will deteriorate over time over the long term. So you must absolutely account for that money. So I take the $6.3 billion, I subtract this number, which is roughly $2 billion. That gives me $4.3 billion rough math of cash from running the business and paying, investing back in the business to maintain and to grow. So you got about $4 billion left. The next thing I wanted to look for is I'm going to scroll down to the final third section, which is the cash flow from financing section. It's how it's what they do with their cash and how they finance the business. So you've got stock buybacks, dividends, and any debt financing that they do is all right here. And what you'll see is you've got dividends paid right there, $2.2 billion. That's roughly consistent, $1.9, $2.1. 2.2. Now, Caterpillar is considered a dividend aristocrat, meaning they have paid the dividend for a very, very long time. They continue to grow it. Good for them. And it is right here, 1.9 billion, 2.1 billion, 2.2 billion. And if you remember, I said cash flow my operations after CapEx is about $4 billion, 2.2 billion off the top to the dividend leaves about $2 billion, rough math, left over. Um, okay, so then what do they do with the rest? Stock, common stock purchases, $1 billion. So they bought back stock. Now they have $1 billion left from that free cash flow. And they've got payments on debt here. And they've got proceeds from the issuance of debt. So this is about $10 billion. 
This is about $10 billion. That's a wash. So their debt issuance and the debt repayment is about the same. They did all of this and they had about a billion dollars left over, which could have been used to pay debt. They chose not to do it. So it looks to me like they can afford the dividend they're paying and they're buying back stock, which is always nice for us to see. So let's go look at the 10 years of financials and put this, bit, uh, this, this company together. Okay, here we go. Let's run through the analysis, income statement, cash flow. We'll come up with our five key attributes. We're gonna see what this business is gonna generate over the decade. Now, I've reformatted my sheet. I'm trying this out. I wanna get your opinion. I've created what I'm calling a cash flow one pager. It's basically cash flow up top, revenue and enterprise in the center, a forecast, stock chart, and some comments. And at the very top here, I've got the five key attributes to quickly summarize where they are. Now, I'm gonna post this on, on the website, cashflowinvestingpro.com. Tell me what you think. Let me know if you, if you would like to see something like this on a regular basis. Um, I can do even more stocks if you'd like to get that as like a monthly subscription. Tell me what you'd like to see. But let's run through this real quick for Caterpillar. 10 years of revenue, $60 billion to $41 billion. Now this bottom number here is COVID resulting, right? So 41 billion, they dropped $10 billion in one year. Uh, that's as a result of COVID. So I can write this year off. But prior to that, I was surprised to see that in fact, they went from $53 billion, sorry about that. They went from 50, $60 billion to $54, $53 billion over this nine year period of time, which is, no growth. It's declining. In fact, when I look at it in its totality, even with the, um, the, the COVID number, it is dropping at a 4% rate. And so if you think about this, here's a company that makes giant equipment uh, used to move lots of rock and, uh, and, and heavy industrial material. Well, those pieces of machinery last a really long time and they can be replaced with replacement parts. So if the globe itself, the world, has had these machines out there for literally decades. Uh, at some point, it becomes saturated and growth begins to peak. So they are trying to pivot and find other ways to generate revenue. They're going into more of a software service model, which is very exciting, but they're not there yet. And that's very, very junior. Right now, the, the majority of their business comes from selling equipment and parts. And I'm just not seeing it grow, which is one of the check boxes that I want to see if I'm putting money to work in a business. So I think this does not check the box for revenue. Let's go look at EBITDA. So EBITDA is our earnings metric for the business. It's enterprise level earnings. It's not EPS at the, at the share level. This is what the business generates on the income statement as a whole, uh, setting aside depreciation and amortization. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the free cash in a second, but this was $9.6 billion to $10.8 billion over the time period, holding aside the COVID year, which is 6.9, kind of a blip. But um, this is very weak growth. In, in all, it's 4% negative because of this drop. But even if I, hold, if, I, if I remove that, it's basically flat. Kind of came down here and then came back up. Uh, not something to write home about. Certainly having something drop and then come back adds risk to the portfolio. If we are gonna try and forecast this forward, if earnings can fall and rise as the economy moves around, that's gonna be more difficult, more uncertainty for us when we forecast. So I think this can't check the box either for me on the, on the growth rate of earnings. Next, debt. Debt is relatively flat in this time period, which I would expect to see because earnings are flat, right? If earnings are growing, then you can allow debt to grow. But if debt is growing and earnings is flat, that's a problem. Here, it's flat. I'm okay with that. Next, market cap. Market cap is shares outstanding times average price. I add these two up, I get enterprise value. Enterprise value is the entire value of the entire enterprise. It's what you're buying. It's this earnings lines up with the value so you can see a payback period. That's what you wanna find out. That's why we look at enterprise level uh, valuation and enterprise level earnings. So the total business went from $90 billion to $110 billion, and then it jumped to $130 billion despite the drop in revenue. So it's clear that people are expecting earnings to pop back up. Okay, now let's take a look at our metrics to see if this is well-priced or if they have too much debt. Enterprise level to EBITDA. So I'm dividing the value of the business divided by its earnings at the enterprise level, and I get a ratio. That ratio can be called, can be referred to as a payback period. It's how much of operating profit the business can generate to buy itself. Uh, it's a payback period. So you can see in the in, in, in a decade ago, it was trading the single digits. Nine and eight times EBITDA is a cheap stock, in my opinion. 
Coming up here, this is kind of a fluke 23 times. No one's ever paying 23 times for Caterpillar. But you can see this period was slightly above 10, 10 times. And then out here, it gets about, about the same. Comes off this high, back down to the 10. 18 is, again, a fluke because of COVID. It looks like the market is writing off that as a one year. They expect it to revert back into, to, into its value of $10 billion of, of, of EBITDA against this higher $130 billion valuation would put it around 11 times or so when it normalizes. So it looks like its trading range realistically is someplace between 9 and 12 on the enterprise value. Debt ratios, to me, it's too high. Look at this. 3.6 billion up to 5 billion when it when 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 earnings fall but prior to that's 3.5 not terribly out of market it's not it's not 5 it's not 10 it's not 15 it's slightly above so we can give it a pass but it's been above every single year so for me I'm probably not going to check that box I want something that's less than 3 times dead if it spikes one year fine but here it's naturally always above that level. And for me, that's just too much debt, especially for a business that can't grow its earnings. I think that's a problem and I don't wanna see that. Okay, that's the revenue enterprise value. Let's check uh, kind of the boxes. We got revenue growth, no. EBITDA growth is very weak. Let's go take a look at that one more time. Um, EBITDA, kind of call this 10, like average, you know, 10. And then if I write this off here, this is about 10. So I would say that's flat. Flat is not growing. So I'm not going to check that box. Uh, too much debt? Yes, it's above 3x. So I'm not going to check that one either. Let's go look at free cash flow. So free cash flow on our chart. And again, I'm just, I'm just going through this chart so you can see it. Free cash flow operations, which we covered earlier in the cash flow statement I'll walk you through, which is the most important. So here's your 6.3 billion. Here's the six billions that I covered historically. And if I re rewind the clock, if I can say that right, basically 6.7 to $5 billion of free cash flow a decade ago, you got a, a monster spike here and it quickly reverted back down. And really it's been largely flat. In fact, that negative 1% jives with the EBITDA of, of minus four, which is close. So that means that the accounting department is expensing cash the way they need to do, and I like to see that. So we know the, 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 the check the box or we, the smell check of the accounting works. It's just not going the right way. Um, CapEx, CapEx again is a big cash cost that is not in the income statement. It's reflected in depreciation, but depreciation is the, is the expense, is this expense stretched out over 20 years or whatever the time frame is based on the asset, but Realistically, depreciation is a non-cash cost. This is real cash that has to come out of pocket that particular year, and they made 3.6 billion. They had to put back two billion dollars back into the business right off the back to have any cash left over. They pay, they they paid a small bit of debt. It was basically a wash, but 600 million outflow, which left the remaining free cash flow to the enterprise of 3.6 billion. Now I referenced earlier, I said dividend and share buyback, all of that comes out of this business, this number. But this number is what the company is based off. Not the dividend yield, not the share buyback. That is a use of proceeds. That's a use of this proceed. But really, whether they pay you a dividend or they buy back the share, uh, you're indifferent. You, you prefer they buy back the share because there's no taxes to it. But this is where that cash comes from. So you want to you want to go up the ladder, if you will, and measure the business on that free cash flow of $3.6 billion. <clears throat> but you can see that business has come down over time, being in line or flat with, with historical, the trend we're seeing. If I keep going across, i got shares outstanding. Shares outstanding have been coming down, down by 2% over this period of time. That is because they are continuing to buy shares. I, we saw that earlier in the free cash flow, right? They're taking some of this free cash flow. They're paying out as a dividend. They're buying back shares. When they buy back shares, that means EPS will go up on flat earnings. So if you look, you look at someone else's sheet that looks at EPS, and that's all they look at, they're going to see a stock that's growing EPS. They're going to say, oh, look, earnings are growing. No, they're not. Earnings are flat. They're growing because the, because Caterpillar is manipulating what you're allowed to do. I don't use that word in a bad phrase, but they're manipulating the number of shares outstanding to boost EPS. And the market looks at EPS. We don't at this channel. We look at hard cash money, and they are not generating it. Free cash flow per share, again, pretty flat, if not declining. Well, it's declining because of this particular year, but 12, call this $10 per share here. 
This is roughly, or ignoring this one, this is basically $10 a here, share right there. So they're, they're flat over a decade. On the yield, they've got two spikes on the free cash flow yield. Again, that's this number here. Well, what it's it's really it's really the it's really this number divided by this because it's on a per share basis. So it's this number, free cash flow per share, divided by the the, the price per share I get a yield. That's the yield you want to pay attention. Don't worry about dividend yield. Dividend yield can be manipulated. They the board of directors can choose how much they want to give out as the dividend. What you want to look for is a free cash flow yield. Um, that's the true yield. And what you'll notice is it spiked up twice. Um, you've got a third double digit here and a double digit there. But outside of that, it's been at the like mid, call that nine, seven. They've been at 7%. So I call it around six to 7% is where their normal free cash flow yield is going to be. Okay. So now where are we? Let's take a look at free cash flow. Free, ca free cash flow is strong. I'll give it to them, but it's not really growing. Um, because earnings aren't growing, and they do have enough cash to pay the, buy, the, buy the dividend, pay their debt service, and buy back stock. So there's, the cash flow is strong. It's just not growing like we want to see. Okay, now next thing we want to do is we actually want to then go through and forecast the price. So what we're going to do is we're going to come down. So now I'm at the bottom of the sheet down here, and I'm forecasting the price. This is our EBITDA forecast. So I'm pulling the last year's EBITDA, 2020's EBITDA, and I'm growing it at 50% year over year. Why? Because everybody expects Caterpillar to revert after COVID. So they're gonna have a nice spike back up. They're gonna go to 10.4 billion, which is what they were doing in 2019 and 2018, kind of reverting back to the average. And I'm giving them a 4% growth to be generous, by the way, 4% growth. They have not been growing 4%. But this is not going to look good, so I might as well give a number in it. I'm going to give it 4%. Maybe for inflation, heavy industrial, they could push that to the customer base. Maybe the subscription piece picks up a little bit and offsets some of the natural decline or flatness. So I'm giving them a 4%. That's kind of a, that's kind of a give here. Uh, but we'll see what it pans out with anyways. So the one, the $10.4 billion turns into $14.8 billion over that decade. Uh, which is which is growth. I'm applying a 12 times multiple to that e to that enterprise level earnings, the EBITDA, which is based on historical. You saw that before. 12 times is, is their is their number. I multiply 14.8 times 12. I get an enterprise value of 178 billion dollars. That is the enterprise value in 10 years that we're forecasting for this business, based on the growth, based on where EBITDA was last year, less some debt that's just an average debt per EBITDA that they had previously, and I get a market cap of just shy of 100 billion dollars out in 10 years. I divide that by the fully diluted shares, and I get a share price, a price per share of 180 dollars and 60 cents out a decade for Caterpillar based on the enterprise value EBITDA market multiple method. That was a lot. Let's do free cash flow. Shift over. Free cash flow right here. 10 years cash flow growth rate. Now growth rate, the same thing. 15% year over year growth because it's going to revert back to the average. The average for them was about $7.6 per share. So I'm reverting back the, don't worry about the difference in the growth rates here. That's that's the base effect. You don't need to grow numbers based on the denominator. So that could be different. The point is, this number is going to revert, revert back to what they were doing in 2019. And then as uh, as they grow EBITDA, that EBITDA will pass through to free cash flow and will naturally grow over time from 7.6 to $10 billion, $10 a share. Now, again, this is aggressive because they haven't been doing this. So I, I'm giving them some like an extra boost because I feel a little bit bad just throwing a zero in here. It's not going to be fun for a video. So I'm putting a little bit in here. Let's see what happens even with a little bit. So out in decade, right, you're waiting a, a 10 years from now, which think about where you're going to be in your life, how much is going to pass between now and 10 years, and, and, and think of where you want your money to be in 10 years. This has gone from 7.6 to $10, not huge. I applied average yield. That yield is what I referenced before, minus the two high yields. The average, average free cash flow yield six six point two percent. Divide these two, I get a price target of one hundred and seventy three dollars and nine cents out ten years from now. Okay. Now we have pre, two price targets. Let's see what can we do with this. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to average. We're going to average this one, and I'm going to average this one because I don't know which one to lean on. They're both pretty close. So I'm going to average the two, and we get to a random price. We're going to go out in the market, take a look and see what the stock is, is which, which you can buy the stock at today. Here we go. 
I can reach into the public market right now and buy all the stock I want at $210 a share. I'm estimating when I average these two methods, market multiple and free cash flow method, I average the two, I get $176 a share as a long-term price target. I can buy them all right now at, at the stock market of 210. If I were to buy the stock at 210, that's an outflow is negative. I'm buying, I'm outflowing cash. I get an inflow of cash uh, uh, per share over the decade. This is my pro rata share of the free cash flow that they'll generate. Even if I don't get all of it, I will get some as a dividend. They will buy back shares, which will boost this share price over time. But it's my stream of cash flow. It's my representative ownership. It's part of the IRR. So I, I buy in this, I get this stream of cash, and I sell this stock in 10 years. This is my net free cash flow on the investment. If I do the IRR on this stream of cash flow, I get a 3% return on my investment annually for a decade. That's with a growth rate of earnings that's above what they've been doing historically. So needless to say, I think that is definitely, definitely below market. It's too much of a risk for us to go after something like this and expect them to turn the business around and materially change the growth forecast. Let's recap where we are with our five key metrics. One, top line revenue growth. No. It's not happening. It's weak, minus 4%. Enterprise earnings, no, I'm not going to give it to. It's not growing, it's earnings. Free cash flow, yes, it has free cash flow. It is strong. I will give them the free cash flow box because they're paying dividend and they're, and they're buying back shares and they can afford to do so. Low debt, less than three times debt, no. Average 5.4% debt. That's not where we want to be. It's way too much debt. It's too much risk of bankruptcy if for some reason people stop buying their, buying their trucks. And well-priced, no, it is not well-priced. Why? How do we know it's not well-priced? Because this return is too low. The S&P 500 will average 10% return for any 10-year period of time that you choose in its history. That 10 years is the market benchmark. Caterpillar is in the S&P 500, it's part of the S&P, and it's going to underperform. That's one of the reasons I don't own index investments, because if you buy the SPY index, you get this garbage along with all the good stuff. So our job as investors is to do a little bit of work, find the, the companies that are above market, and just pick those. It's not rock and science, there's no guarantees on anything but it's how you can intelligently approach investing and give yourself self the best chance of beating the stock market over a long period of time. So that is a 3%. That's a hard pass for us. I'm giving this a bad investment, not because I don't like the equipment, the product, the people, none of that. This is purely from an investor standpoint. I'm putting capital to risk by buying it at $200 a share. I'm gonna get a stream of cash flow that could change based on growth rates for sure. But it's going to be in a, in a range. It's not going to go to $100 a share. It's going to be maybe maybe it's $5 a share, maybe it's $12 a share, whatever. But it's not going to be materially higher. And I'm still going to be, at best, 3% because we're having a growth rate. So for me, again, it's a bad investment. There are so many other stocks out there. In the U.S. stock market alone, there's over 3,000 stocks. If you did this for all 3,000, I bet you could find some heck of investments. By the way, I'm doing this. I'm, 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 I'm valuing them. I'm going to start publishing this work. We're going to start burning through these, these stocks, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Let's look at the distribution. So here's a distribution of the actual stock return. So right now, the stock is at uh, $210 is producing 3% return. If, if the stock goes up in price, return falls. How, how low does the stock have to fall before I'm buying it? I mean, that's what, 50 bucks off of that. That's a 25% haircut just to get still mid single digit IRR. So for me, I'm not touching this stock for a long, long time. I think uh, there's easier money to be made out there with that doesn't need so many assumptions. So we're going to pass. Thank you very much for watching the channel. If you want to learn how to do uh, investing like this, I do teach a course. It's at cashflowinvestingpro.com where I give you an Excel template like this. I teach you how to fill it out. I teach you how to read a 10K, how to pull out the pieces of material, what EBITDA means, why it's interesting, where to calculate it, what all these numbers mean, and how to forecast, how to build a portfolio of a handful of stocks. Remember, if this is in the S&P 500 and you buy the S&P 500 index, then you own this crappy investment. Why not just pick the best performers and hold those over a lifetime? How do you calculate best performance? Well, you got to do a little research. But if you read a 10K every week, you'd read 50 10Ks in a year, 52. 
uh, that would be amazing. And I bet you after that year of reading those 52 10Ks, you would be able to t pick 10 amazing stocks out of that group that would change your portfolio and your life forever. So I really encourage you to read the data. It's fascinating to do so and focus that portfolio on the high performing stocks. If you want to learn how to do that, go to my course, check it out. I'm happy to talk to you. Also, thank you to all the rational investors out there that are commenting on the channel, giving me amazing, amazing suggestions down below. If you're not reading the comments, definitely, definitely read the comments. There's some jewels that I just cannot get to uh, on this channel, but I, but I do I definitely look at them. My name is Cameron Stewart. This is Rational Investing. Uh, let me know what you'd like to see next week and I'll be happy to do it. Okay, thank you very much. Take care.